This podcast is made possible by Venna. Hi, this is Rob Young. I am the CFO at National Geographic Society, and you are now listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 861. We don't know what's going to happen, but we have to be flexible across the board. I, I like to look forward and say, in 18 months' time, two years' time, if I was to look back, what would I have done? Like, What would good look like? And so using that as a frame of reference, we made early decisions around X. We are really successful in two years because we didn't do Y. That's sort of the framework that we try and apply. So managing through the recession, you know, for us, continuing to scale and focus on our operational efficiency and our path to profitability, and then delivering against our budget. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with David Quinn, CFO of Blue Vine. There's just no doubt about it, things were going downhill for David Quinn when he met his future wife, or such might be the obvious punchline following Quinn's disclosure that he met his wife on a ski vacation. Still, Quinn lets us know that the timing of his match being made was in sync with the escalating financial crisis of the late 2000s. A grim environment that quickly fogged over the career trajectories of many banking executives, and Quinn was no exception. On today's show, David Quinn explains how making a match helped open the door to new opportunities only one ocean away. That story and much more on today's episode. We begin after this. Managing multiple spreadsheets, disconnected data, Numbers you just can't trust. Your finance team can't be the strategic partner your organization needs right now with obstacles like that getting in your way. Venna can change that. Venna brings people, processes, and systems together in a single collaborative analytical platform so you can drive connected business planning and better decision making. And it's the only native Excel complete planning platform built for Microsoft 365 with Power BI embedded. With Venna, your financial and operational data is always connected and your teams are always armed with insights and time to focus on what matters most. So when the stakes are high and the margin for error low, plan with agility, plan with resilience, plan with Venna so you can be prepared for whatever comes next. Visit venasolutions.com slash planning aces to learn more about how Venna will help you plan for anything. Hello, we're speaking with David Quinn, CFO of Blue Vine. David, welcome. Hey, nice to meet you, Jack. Yeah, likewise, David. Uh, You might know that we kick off every episode with this same question, but every finance leader has a little different background, a little different path that they took to the CFO office. And what we're looking for is for you to highlight some of those experiences that you feel best prepared you for this role you have today as CFO of Blue Vine. What, What would come to mind? Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> it's interesting because I think everybody's career is full of different moments and different experiences, and there's so much you can take from your own experiences and those that you observe in others. There's a few that really stand out to me as moments where you know either I was tested, learned a great deal, uh, was challenged in a particular way. I think one of the first ones I spent the first. Um, maybe seven, eight years of my career in in banking in London. And it was a time in the late 1990s, early 2000s. There was a lot of movement. And I landed roles at uh, at Morgan Stanley and at uh, at Citibank. 
And in two of the roles that I started, when I turned up on day one, my hiring manager was no longer there. And it was a case of, you've been hired, this team is yours, go figure everything out. And it's, it's interesting because at moments like that, you have to really go deep. You had to, for me personally, I had to start from scratch. These, are, these were complicated derivative products. I had to really dig in, go back, trace journal entries, look at the balance sheets, um, find out where to get information, who to get information from, how to interpret it, what reporting was available. Um, it was really a time where it was sink or swim. And these are, you know, you're up against deadlines the whole time. You're working with a front office trading team. So they are sort of notoriously impatient uh, and come first. And so you're trying to provide this high service with a brand new team, no knowledge, uh, and really, you know, time pressures. And so for me, it was, a, it was really a point of my career where it was the easy option would have been to say, I'm out of here, I'll go find something else or say no to certain requests. I think what it did for me personally is really helped me understand the fundamentals, um, go back, figure things out, you know, effectively go back to my accounting manual, right? And I'm not the world's strongest accountant. I can, I can tell you that for nothing. Um, so that was really interesting. And it, 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 what, it, what it showed to me was when the fire is there, it's really when I excel. Like I love that, um, that busy period, not knowing what's happening, but just trying to figure everything out. That's what keeps it, I think, finance really, really interesting. I'm, I'm curious, you stuck with banking. And uh, again, the, the downturn does occur, I suppose, while you're you're sort of uh, climbing the ladder there. And uh, you had the option maybe to leave. You had an FP&A resume. It was strong. You could have gone to other industries. You stuck with banking. Why? Yeah. You know what? There's a couple of reasons. Um, so one, this is, it's, it's sort of an evolving um, space. So I think you know, it's a it's a product which is used by everyone in the world, right? Like pretty much everyone needs banking service. Everybody needs a way to move money around. Everyone needs um, businesses need a way to uh, to grow. They need access to capital and the services. So it's one of those industries, although somewhat um, um, I wouldn't say somewhat secular in that it goes uh, with credit cycles can go up and down. Um, it's, it's a need that is there continuously for, for if effectively all of the economy, all aspects of the economy. Um, you know, FP&A, when I, when I started my career, I had an option, right? Like typically in the UK, um, where I grew up, there's two paths into accountancy. There's your chartered, account, chartered accountancy path, so your public practice path. And then we have, um, a management accountancy. Right. So they're both three year programs, modular based. You have to do all your CPEs and your credits. And I chose that management accountancy one because um, my my love of accounting is limited in some ways. Right. I love the management side. I love the strategic. I love the profitability, like very close to the business. Um, I'm not as strong in the technical accounting sides. And I just generally have less uh, less desire and interest in that space. So. That really drove my path to be more, uh, be, be more broad. And so when it came to, you know, should I move out and get another FP&A role? Like a little bit of it is stick with it, stick with banking. It's a long-term career. Um, there are so many evolving niches and spaces, as you sort of see today in the fintech space, in the payment space, it's continuing evolving and in innovating. And that's really why I, I stuck it out there. I'd like to point out uh, when a finance leader dedicates a number, you know, a, a good portion of years to a to a company. You were at Citibank nearly uh, five years, well, four and a half years, and then uh, you were at uh, Bank of the West um, for for quite some time, nine years or close to ten years. Now, with the Bank of the West, do you come to uh, the U.S.? Where are you geography wise after Citibank? 
Yeah, so so Citibank was just was a phenomenal experience in many ways because um, I started off in a small part of the business, the wealth management business, that was growing rapidly. We had new structured products, um, and so that was continually evolving. And then uh, at one point, uh, I was tapped to take on a couple of the other businesses, a business out of France, a business out of Belgium. So I was integrating those. At the same time, did my first M&A, selling a portfolio, um, which, was, which was an incredible experience, like just going through that due diligence, all of the pricing, and then through the, the, the final closure. And a part of that, um, the CEO at the time, um, had gone to business school in the US. And so he selected a small number of us, I think it was six of us from across the 27 countries in Europe to do an MBA uh, or executive MBA at the University of Chicago. So, and the deal was invest your time, do this MBA, you'll get the choice of whatever job that you like, right? We're building talent for the future. Uh, we just need to invest more in the people. So we went through this program uh, it was 18 months. You know, we were traveling between Chicago, Singapore, or London, um, and you're working at the same time, right? So it's like a pretty intensive period of, of, of your life. Um, and at the end of it, the CEO was no longer the CEO. He left. Um, the, the promise of whatever job we wanted for me turned out to be CFO of Norway, and Norway was not a big business uh, for Citibank at the time. It would have been very much a sidestep. And so it was the financial, you know, heading into the financial crisis, I just met the, uh, the, the lady that would become my wife, um, actually on a skiing vacation in Austria. And, you know, I had, to, had some decisions to make. And so ultimately, w- with the MBA, with uh, um, uh, an American fiancé then at the time, I decided to move to the U.S. And that really, uh, the move there was really driven out of relationship and marriage uh, and to really then start my career on the retail banking side of Bank of the West. And tell us something about that. I, I think you joined Bank of the West in 2009, a hard time to, to step into a banking role. I mean, there weren't very few uh, uh, you know, recruiters out there looking to fill those spots, I don't think. Let me take this for a little while and see if things improve with the economy. Or what were you? What were you experiencing? Yeah, I think my my feeling at the time was I just need a job, right? And um, it was it was a really interesting interview process. Um, I turned up, uh, m- met the team, and the CFO at the time was not there. He'd been called to a meeting in San Francisco, and the the back office was maybe twenty miles away. So the next day I went into San Francisco. Um, they'd obviously, they'd, the team had obviously told him like, you, you should hire this person. And so he took me up to the, the 25th floor in the boardroom overlooking the bay. Uh, and he sold me on the company. I'm like, well, I need a job. You're selling me um, and I'm in. And about three months later, I was, I was a VP there looking after the management reporting, the head of FP&A left. Um, and then so I became the head of FPNA very quickly. And as you say, there was a lot of change happening there. The, the Bank of the West had grown through acquisition. It's actually a subsidiary of a French bank uh, called BNP Paribas. So you've got this French connection, you're a subsidiary uh, in a 10 hour time zone, and you're in the financial crisis, and you don't have a lot of great information systems within the organization that had grown through acquisition. It was highly, um, it was highly fragmented. Every time they did an acquisition, they got rid of the legacy information, just to a point of time and went forward, which of course, when um, Dodd-Frank was implemented in, in 2010, which was very much focused on um, bank regulation and stability in, in, in ensuring appropriate capital levels, it brought with it a whole new suite of opportunities for someone in finance um, with a willingness to jump in and learn. And that's really what I ended up doing for the next 10 years there was a whole variety of roles within treasury, within finance, um, within this new area called CCAR, which is capital stress testing, um, 
rolling out new profitability frameworks because the whole basis of how you looked at profitability shifted overnight with these higher capital requirements. And so it was just a, it was a really, really interesting place to be. We, we often joked it should be, um, you know, Harvard Business Review case just because of how much was going on in such a, such an intense period of time. The, uh, of course, uh, we're, we're building to, to your arrival at Blue Vine, but we're wondering if you had gotten an itch regards to joining a smaller fintech. Uh, you know, as your nine years there unfolded, there was more and more perhaps opportunities to explore. Yeah, it's interesting. Towards the end of my time at Bank of the West, um, one of the reasons I stayed is because of the CFO been working together a long time, incredibly smart individual. Um, and we had a, a really good working relationship. Um, but after he left, um, you know, that was really my cue to start looking for something else. You know, I had wanted the CFO role there. Uh, it was a couple of us that were in the bidding for it. They ended up bringing somebody over from Paris to become the CFO uh, because it was French owned. And at that point, that was that was my decision made. So I was actually offered um, uh, a couple of fintech role, CFO roles. I think interestingly, going back to experience, what one of the roles I was offered was with a subsidiary, uh, and so it was a it was a private company had just been acquired, and I'd made a decision that I would never work for a subsidiary or a foreign owned um, subsidiary either, and so that was a, that was a non starter for me, and it turned out to be a good decision uh, as a. Uh, as I found out later. Well, we'll want to uh, ask you a few more career related questions and we'll come back after you fill us in a little more about v Blue Vine and ask you about your arrival there and what have you. But right now, tell us about Blue Vine. I think it's fairly well known out there in the fintech circles, but for a broader audience, maybe you can tell us about it. What does it do? What 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 sets it apart out there? Yeah. So Blue Vine effectively saves small business owners time so they can focus on what's important, which is running their business. So we launched in 2013 um, and we work to enable a better financial future for about 450,000 small businesses to date with our simple, innovative solutions really around banking, bill management and credit. Three things which are critical for small businesses. So we are targeting really SMBs, think companies, less than 20 people. It could be a small restaurant, a pizza shop, a flower shop, anyone who has um, uh, revenues, a few employees, uh, and has needs above and beyond basic banking. So we have an online checking account. We're 100% digital. We have the access to credit, so our lines of credit, and we have a bill pay solution that can both pay bills, manage bills, integrates with QuickBooks, so it solves a lot of headaches that small businesses have. One of the one of the things that most attracted me about this offering is it is that no one else is really doing it, right? Like if, if you if you read the statistics. Um, so many small businesses are underserved by the traditional banks. It's an area which is just not profitable for them at the scale which they operate. Uh, and they're not building for them. They're not building solutions. Banks tend to build for the larger you know, revenue clients, think 5 million plus in revenue. So they're largely underserved. And if they do apply for credit, they have about an 80% chance of being rejected. So it's it's really a chance, and we're passionate about our mission at Blue Vine to serve small businesses specifically, given they're the, the backbone of the U.S. economy. Now, could you maybe uh, give us a, an abbreviated history of its capital structure? Where is it today, this company, in terms of its funding? Yeah. So we are a Series F company. Um, we are a few years out from profitability. 
Um, we have a lot of investors. So we have investors from 83 North, from Lightspeed, from SVB Capital. Um, and it's it's got a very, very strong balance sheet. We have a very strong balance sheet today. And that's, you know, again, one of the other reasons that uh, that I was keen to join is that we have a lot of runway. It's in a unique segment and we have such a talented team. And the mission to serve small businesses is something that unites all of the leadership team and all of our employees. So you've been there now a little over a year. Maybe you can tell us uh, as you arrive what your immediate priorities may have been. And I don't know if you reorganized finance in some way or made a key hire. Don't know. But what would you tell us about the things you wanted to get done with like, like that first hundred days everyone always talks about? Yeah, the what, what's amazing about the team is they're extremely talented. I've been really lucky to inherit um, very talented FP&A team, talented capital markets team, um, and an accounting function which is very strong. So that so from a reorganization perspective, no reorganization required. It's a it's a traditional traditional finance function. That is working working really well. Um, what I what I have done is added some additional capacity. So I've added our first procurement hire. So we now have a head of procurement. We're at the size and scale. We have about two hundred million in spend, um, where it makes sense to have someone oversee that um, and generate uh, some cost savings and deal with the vendor negotiations that are currently done. Um, you know, really distributed across the organization. So we have an opportunity to centralize that. And then the other is to bring in um, a couple of people with more, I would say, I set up a strategic initiatives function and a couple of folks that are a little bit more seasoned in the banking space. So they have really great insights to help drive more governance, more structure, more control around um around all of the organization. And that, that, that's really key as we scale and because we are involved in banking activities, um, you know, we are de facto regulated through our partner banks. Being able to add that, um, add that risk governance, set up an audit committee, things like that, has been a critical step in the first, uh, in the first six months there. How is your, your visibility um... As the, as the CFO, visibility into the customer, we know that you're looking at those renewals most likely, and I suppose it's a unit economic metrics. What, what else are you paying attention to as it relates to the customer? Yeah, I, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a few, right? On the one hand, um, you know, it is the, the NPS of the customer. We track that very, very closely, um, both our NPS and our employee NPS. Um, we track the penetration of the customers. So between the products, how much are they using them? Um, what is the profitability of the dif different customer segments that we have? How well are they being served? Do we have the right support functions in place? So there's there's a whole host of metrics. I think sort of maybe zooming out for a second, we operate using the OKR structure. So the objective key results. And I've been doing that um, at Blue Vine. We did it at Silicon Valley Bank as well. I think it's a really powerful framework beyond KPIs because it really helps you look at the objective. And, and you can change your key results frequently, right? Like they don't stay the same every year. As you shift, you shift your, your OKRs and your key results for really what you're focused on over that period. So for us, um, you know, the customer, we do look at top of the funnel. We look at pull through. We look at the conversion. So that top to bottom is is really critical, both because it um, it's an indication of of how well our products are working per se, how well everything is digitized, uh, which in turn reduces our cost basis for everything, and of course. You know, if you have people that have signed up for a service but not actually activated, you know, it's much easier and cheaper to get those folks to sign up than it is to to get new folks through the door, right? So focusing on our, our customer acquisition costs, 
um, and then our, our contribution margins. Just thinking about the large enterprises that you sort of built your career within to arrive here at Blue Vine and whether you, you know, you have the opportunity maybe to be more hands on or more influential in terms of the types of metrics and the visibility they enjoy within the organization. You know, at the banks, you were probably this is really important, but it would take a good deal of effort to. Uh, to raise the profile of a certain metric or get it on a dashboard or bring it up at the meeting. I don't know. It seems like in this smaller organization, you can be really uh, sort of responsive. Are you enjoying some sort of greater influence over how the organization is absorbing the information or the, the data? Yeah, no, I, I, it, it's such an insightful point there, Jack. Yeah, I love what I do and moving from a large organization to a small organization. Somebody said it to me, um, a friend who'd made a similar transition. He said, when you think you're moving fast, you're not. And, and that is really, really clear. Like we move at a phenomenal pace and the speed of decision making, like, hey, I want to see this metric. Okay, done. Like get on dashboard. There's no big lengthy discussion around it. Um, and that I think is critical. Like you don't like there's just less bureaucracy, less um, less discussion around things. It's it's all focused on the execution part. Um, it was specifically to those metrics. Uh, one of the things that, that we did was set up a risk committee. Right. So as a subset of the audit committee, we have a risk committee within that risk committee. We monitor certain metrics. So we created a risk appetite. And so there's a whole bunch of new metrics that we weren't looking at previously that we're now looking at. And and the ability to do that in a short space of time, you know, two, three months um, is is pretty phenomenal. Like it would have taken a much longer time in a log, in a larger organization, one to source the data, agree the definitions, run it by all the different levels. Here, um, you have less complexity, and you have less um, uh, certainly a lot less politics around things, and so it's more test and learn, test and learn, continuous iteration. And, and the staff and the executives uh, are supportive of that process and you can see the bigger picture. I would say what, one of the, one of the I would say challenges or things to be aware of that I'm always checking myself is moving from a large corporation to a smaller corporation is making sure that you're not overbuilding, right? And, and so fit for purpose is something that you know, I try and live by all the time. What, what is good enough? Right. Like this doesn't have to be world class. We're still evolving. Um, but what is fit for purpose, fit for this size of organization? What can we consume with the resources that we have? I would imagine as well that your colleagues and the people who report to you don't necessarily have a traditional banking background, which I think we could characterize yours having come up through. Uh, but correct me. And, and is it more uh is Blue Vine's workforce more diversified in, you know, in, in that respect? Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, would, I would say that's true. We have a, a number of ex-investment um, bankers in the FP&A side, ex-analysts uh, and investors. So we, like folks have a very, very strong financial understanding um, and a good understanding of banking, but not to the level that is sort of really, um, it really required. So that, that's still part of the ongoing journey. And I think that's, that's part of the education that I bring to the organization is how to start structuring that and, and make us a little more formal, um, you know, because we're not a bank. We are regulated through our bank partners who are, are wonderful to work with. But still, we need to operate at a capacity such that they feel confident that we are operating in, in a safety and soundness uh, in manner. There's a uh, conference hall down the hall from you, conference room. You walk down and you swing open the door and your FP&A team is around the table. What are they thinking? Oh, no, David's going to ask us about this. What, what is it that they're uh, thinking you're about to? quiz them on 
right now this this uh, month budget um so we are obviously like many fpna functions furiously working on our plans for for 2023 and i give the team a lot of credit because you know forecasting for any fpna team over the last couple of years has been very very difficult um you know with us on the brink of a formal recession here i think it gets it gets even harder um we don't know like the signs are there on the consumer side they're starting to emerge on the small business side what does that mean for us what action should we take against that and this is the first time that you know put COVID aside um that i think the business is really going to be tested in that way uh across all of our functions across risk across finance across legal it just you know recessions have a way of grinding things down and right now we're in this in this phase of uncertainty so sort of one of the things that that i've been asking is like how much flexibility do we have how much do we have to commit where are we investing and as a as a cash burning startup still right focused on cash preservation focused on path to profitability um, and focused on unit economics. And I think those are, you know, we've got the execution of our product roadmap, but those are things from, from a finance perspective that we are really, really focused on. I want to just quickly touch on talent with you. And again, you, you kind of straddle these two different worlds during your career, large, larger banks, and now uh, this at Blue Vine. Um, and as a finance leader, and we just went through COVID. So a lot of finance leaders would tell us they've kind of become more focused on talent and understanding some of the challenges. When it comes to talent, how has your thinking evolved perhaps in, in uh, the last couple of years? Yeah, I, w- I would say if you, if you went back even further, I would have said hire lots of people like me who are going to work hard, heads down. Um, that, that, that doesn't work, right? Like a whole bunch of mini me's running around um is is a recipe for disaster the so having the diversity i think you know of of thoughts um of of ideas like that's so so important the you know, people are incredibly important to blue vine and we put a lot of effort into retaining training providing career opportunities in a smaller organization you're constantly looking ways for it to improve retention because you are so, so small. Um, you need to provide these right opportunities. You know, for us, um, we do focus heavily on um, our employee engagement scores. We run our annual surveys. We have um, task forces, which are set to, to um, implement outcomes of those surveys. But generally, I think we, we have to be more flexible. Like if I look at the productivity of, of the finance team, they can do a lot remotely, right? Like there's so much they can do uh, online. We, we are as, a, as an organization in hybrid mode. So we're in the office two days a week, remote three days a week. And those two days a week in the office, are, are, I believe are so important for our culture, for our team, just spending time together, connectivity, and for our more junior employees, like that really the chance to learn from others and ask questions that you, you don't get to do when everything is much more transactional online. Um, so I haven't, my, my view of the type of talent that we want to attract hasn't changed. You should always attract the best possible talent that you can. Like I, I um, you know, having people that are more skilled than you is always, it's cliche, but it's very, very helpful. Like I couldn't do a lot of what my team does, uh, but I can do other things and I appreciate what they can do. And hopefully they appreciate some of the things that I can bring to the team as well. We're going to uh, jump to our finance strategic moment question. Again, this is sort of our signature question where we just ask you to recall a moment of strategic that uh, insight that you experienced along the way during your career could have been any time. Might have been at Citibank, might have been at Bank of the West, might have been at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, but it's something that you saw because as a finance leader, you could look into the business, your lines of sight went deep, whether it was a risk or an opportunity. Anything come to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example here from really, really early in my career because it helped shape a lot of how I think about things. Um, and it's like, I, I, I call it finding my pull. And so right out of college, I got a job at a company called British Aerospace. It's, uh, it's an ex-nationalized industry. Um, it went private a few years before, but it still had a lot of the legacy, um, I would say, government way of working. I didn't retained a lot of those people. And I was hired in on their management training program. They were sponsoring me to do my accounting qualification uh, and, you know, I was really excited. Like I'd found a job. I was like feeling pumped. I'd found, found this job. I got to put a suit on. I was right outside of London, which is where I wanted to be. Um, and I found a house to live. Like everything was great. And I turn up and they were, oh, well, we need to figure out what to do with you then. And so we wrote this plan for the first year, like, here's what you do every three months. You're going to do a stint in accounts receivable, accounts payable, treasury, like learn the basics, project accounting. And then next year, um, we'll give you some real responsibility. Fine. So uh, I went through, did my rotations uh, in, in, in treasury and uh, accounts receivable. And then I did my stint in accounts payable. And this is where I met Paul. And Paul was this sort of portly, agely, jolly fellow. And he'd been there forever. And he said, this is how we do it. We walk over to here. We pick up the invoices in the morning. We come back over here and I get a cup of coffee. So then I sort out all the invoices. I stamp them. I code them. I put them over here. Someone else delivers them around the organization. Uh, I wait for them to come back. And then I process them. And that's it. It's like, you got it? I'm like, got it. <clears throat> so we had a couple of hours training. I took over. Paul went off and wandered somewhere for the rest of the day. He, he was a master because he could, his, his trick was that he could pick up a piece of paper and he could say, I can walk around anywhere in this building with a piece of paper and nobody questions what I'm doing. But to give you an insight into, into, into Jolly Paul. So I'm doing this. A few hours in, he's like, came back, said, slow down. You're going too fast. Um, so I slowed down a little bit. After a week, I kind of figured out what the uh, what the MO was. And I was dying. I've got 11 more weeks of doing this. Like, there has to be a better way. And what I noticed is of the few hundred invoices I was processing every day, a lot of these were very, very low value. Think under $10. I'm like, why am I post processing an invoice for like, you know, basically some of these are pennies. And it turns out uh, that every time this was an aircraft leasing business, every time they took a widget off the off the shelf, it created an invoice. They take a washer or a nut, like a filter. It created an invoice uh, from another intercompany entity. One entity that did the servicing of the engines would bill us who were doing the leasing of the aircraft. Uh, and so uh, the following week, I think I had my uh, my, my quarterly uh, quarterly check in with the CFO. And he said, "How's it going?" And I said, "It's going great, but I've got this problem. Like I'm processing invoices, and I've got now ten more weeks to go, and I'm dying." He's like, well, "What's the problem?" I'm like, "Well, a lot of the invoices I'm processing have very very low value." He's like, "Well, what are you going to do about it?" And I looked at him like, "What do you mean? What am I going to do about it?" He's like, "Go figure it out." So I had to, and that was sort of the thing was like, okay, you own it now. Like you're here. Don't just pro, you're not here to learn. You're here to change and do things. And so eventually I went to the factory, saw the, saw the machine where they were taking everything from, the Ukrainians invoices. Uh, and I felt empowered to make change. And so I came up with a couple of ideas. Well, can you turn the invoice off of the machine? No, we can't do that because it's binary. If it turns it off for one, it turns it off for everything. So I added up the, the value of these low value invoices. It was maybe 10,000 pounds a month, right? These intercompany invoices. So like it's left pocket, right pocket stuff. And so I created this sort of interim solution where we would just pay them $10,000 a month. They would not send us the invoices. They would deduct everything from it. Uh, and we'd settle up at the end of each month. I didn't have to do anything. I, I was the happiest man alive at this point. 
And but my fatal flaw, Jack, my fatal flaw was not telling Paul about this. I thought he'd be thrilled. He was so pissed. Like, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to lose my job over this. Like, like it was brutal. Uh, and, you know, I always look back on that moment of you're trying to do the right thing for an organization. I hadn't communicated with my stakeholders. I'd taken the initiative and done the right thing at the broader level, but I hadn't considered, you know, working with the people closest to me. I had zero empathy for, for him, quite frankly. Um, and I didn't communicate any change management. And it, it, it reminds me, there's a great book that we, an operations book by, I think it's Goldrat and Cox, where there's a Herbie character, like you know, he's a Boy Scout, and you, you need to look for your Herbie in your business. And Paul's always been my Herbie. He's the, there's an inefficiency everywhere. And you know, you have to go and look after it. And if you, you know, the sort of motto I have now is like, be curious, pull on every thread that you can, don't take no for an answer and keep pushing. Because you know, this more and more you unravel things, you will find that there's things at the end which are an absolute treasure trove for, for finance folks, right? And you use this in when we're looking at transformation, like across the board, it's something that's always stuck with me. Uh, like I need to find my pull. There's just no doubt about it. Things were going downhill for David Quinn when he met his future wife, or such might be the obvious punchline following Quinn's disclosure that he met his wife on a ski vacation. Still, Quinn lets us know that the timing of his match being made was in sync with the escalating financial crisis of the late 2000s, a grim environment that quickly fogged over the career trajectories of many banking executives, and Quinn was no exception. On today's show, David Quinn explains how making a match helped open the door to new opportunities only one ocean away. That story and much more on today's episode. We begin after this. We're, we're going to uh, jump to our mentoring round where I get to ask you several quick questions intended to inform and inspire future finance leaders. Um, we already asked you about this more or less, but I'm wondering if you could just look back to your first 30 days there at Blue Vine. Is there a piece of advice you would give yourself just something for all of what laid ahead? I think, you know, two ears, one mouth. So definitely listen more, right? Like listen across the board. Don't jump to conclusions. Um, you know, things that it, it's much, it's much more beneficial to listen for longer before passing judgment. Um, so I think I do a reasonable job of that. I think you can always be better at it. Great. Uh, we always like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side. We're wondering if you have a personal habit or part of a daily routine might be outside of work, might be something a family member would point out to us. This is how David does it. He's always done it that way. Or David's, you know, known to do this. Uh, it's something he enjoys and keeps him on an even keel. I don't know. Is there something that you do or part of a routine that you have that you're known for, David? Um, well, I do, I do like doing, um, Wordle, Quirtle, Octurtle, uh -huh. and Nerdle. So I like those little, like the one, four, eight blockers. And there's a little math one you can do. I do that every day as part of my routine. A little, uh, a you, little you are, um, we had one other in the last 30 days, I think, uh, one other CFO share a Wordle, uh, fixation. Yes. A habit. Yeah. Well, she, she should definitely try Octurtle as well. It's a classic. Really? Don't, don't. And you get to do them in order. Yeah, it's, it's spectacular. Is that, is, is that one owned by the New York Times? I know Wordle is, right? Uh, is... I don't know. I think there are a bunch of spinoffs from it. Like I just have the, the website and Octurtle is, is classic. They have a timed one. They have one with blocks in it now as well. So that, that, that brings me a lot of enjoyment in the morning. 
Uh, we'd like to ask uh, if you have a book recommendation for us. It doesn't have to be a business book. It might just be something you escape with. Don't know. Um, I can tell you the last book I read was um, Barbarians at the Gate, which is uh, it's an old it's classic like, 18 book about. Yeah, it's a classic. And it's it's funny. Like I read it years and years ago, but now I've moved everything on to audio books. Um, and the guy's voice is great. And it's just, a, it was just nice to revisit it again. Yep. Uh, are those so I do are, like that. Sorry, do, do you have a habit of listening uh, on a commute or are they more uh, vacation time or, you know, uh, when you listen to audiobooks, where do you absorb them? Plane flights? Mostly on commute and flights. And then sometimes in the evening in bed, I'll, I'll try and do an hour a day. I've got a, I've got a, I don't, here's the problem. I don't finish one at a time. So I'll jump into one. I think I've got three on the go right now. <laughs> Atomic Habits is another one I'm listening to right now. And Guns, Germs, and Steel, I think I'm listening to as well. I've got a, I've got a bunch on the go. That's great. Thank you for those. Uh, we're finally uh, at our last question, uh, where we're going to ask you to look forward for us the next 12 months. You already gave us a little indication as to the economic environment. But we're wondering what your priorities are as a CFO over this next 12 months. Yeah, I think, number one, you, you nailed it, which is you know, guiding us through this recession. I think that is, is front and foremost. I, <clears throat> we don't know what's going to happen, but we have to be flexible across the board. I, I like to look forward and say, in 18 months' time, two years' time, if I was to look back, what would I have done? Like, What would good look like? And so using that as a frame of reference, um, you know, we made early decisions around X. We are really successful in two years because we didn't do Y. Um, and I think that that's sort of the framework that we try and apply. So managing through the recession, you know, for us continuing to scale, um, we're at sort of a, a critical point. So continuing to scale and focus on our operational efficiency and our path to profitability. Um, and then delivering against our budget, right? Like the budget this year, again, I think is going to be dynamic and, and making sure that we understand um, where we can flex that and what our options are. Um, so really, you know, it's continuing to scale. And you know, sort of the obvious one for a tech company is the execution piece. We have a robust product roadmap that we have to execute. And so, you know, removing all obstacles that, that we can, that I can help remove um, to deliver against that, that roadmap. David Quinn, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thank you so much. Hello, Thought Leader listeners. As you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as thought leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.